Uh, well, let's start, though, with a, with a, with a well-known well sentence. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Um, so L.P. Hartley opens his novel, The Go-Between. And history is an exquisite form of tourism. Um, it frees you to travel through the past. It liberates you from the tyranny of the present. And any historian is bound to cherish that fact. You just are free to roam um, in a way you aren't if you're simply imprisoned in your own culture. It teaches you lessons which you otherwise might not learn, like tourism. But like all useful tools, history can be abused. And there's only one thing than, uh, worse than learning no lessons from history, and that is learning the, the wrong lessons. Uh, unfortunately, the second is almost always the case. And so, I, you know, I'm led to um, the view that a little history is even more dangerous than no history. And the reason is that the history most people study is actually a history um, of national myth, nationalist myth-making. Historical research is almost powerless in face of the power of the myths with which people grow up and which they believe to be the clue to their identity and their future. Um, and so that leads me to one discouraging conclusion, which is that good history doesn't give you peace. Um, peace gives you good history. Uh, people can take a more balanced view about European history, because after two dreadful civil wars and centuries of fighting, the European nations decided they no longer wanted to fight each other. And that led to the virtual end of nationalist history. And one can actually then start getting some decent history about the past. Um, and this leads to another conclusion, which I think is, is um, also uh, uh, discouraging. Um, the historian A.J.P. Taylor opened his, book, uh, his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire with the words, history is the story of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. And the implication of that is that humankind progresses through its crimes, follies, and misfortunes. We need them in order to make progress. It's not writing history that gives us progress. It's actually experiencing these crimes. Now, morally, that's a very, very uh, uncomfortable position because you can't advocate crimes, follies, and misfortunes in order to make progress, even though you recognize that that is actually the, the main engine of progress or has been in, in, in the past. Um, and you see this in small things. And, you know, nothing like, you know, the great, the great catastrophes. The crash of 2008, 2009, and the slump that followed. It, you needed that slump in order to get to people to think about economics again and to realize that the various flaws in the existing economic paradigms and the existing, uh, existing uh, principles of economic policy. I'm not sure that the crash was big enough uh, in order to um, create a, a really good new economics or new economic life, but it, it, was, the, it was the goad, it was the trigger for re-evaluation. Um, so, but you can't say, look, let's, um, let's um, try to get a really big crash next time, and then we'll make progress. Of course, normal and not sensible person, you try to avoid the next crash, and therefore possibly make it more likely um, several years um, further on the line. Um, now, that leads me to another discouraging conclusion. Um, all politicians and statesmen pay, pay lip service to learning from history, but in fact they don't learn that much. I mean, appeasement never pays is one of the conclusions we um, supposedly learned from the 1930s. Appeasement often pays. It may be the appeasement of Hitler in particular didn't pay, but um, that's not, it's not a general rule. I mean, here's an example. In 1979, Afghanistan was drip, drifting towards civil war. I mean, there was a, uh, a Soviet-backed regime in Kabul, and the Muhajideen um, uh, raised, raised the banner of rebellion. And in 1979, the Politburo met and unanimously decided they were not going to intervene. 
there would be no single Russian soldier sent to, uh, to Afghanistan except maybe advised in an advisory role, rather like the Americans in Vietnam in, 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 at the beginning of their involvement. Then they got sucked in and sucked in for one reason or another, and in the end there were 150,000 Soviet troops there. And they stayed, and, and what they decided to do, they justified their, their mission finally on the grounds of nation building. Then they got out, it was too expensive, they weren't actually getting it very far, and uh, the, the Mujahideen uh, mutated into the Taliban and took control, and then what happened? Then the Americans got involved. They said they were certainly never going to intervene in Afghanistan, only do it indirectly, but then they got involved, and then there were a large American force entered the country. Admittedly, there were lots of justification, it's still there. And the country is not pacified. There's been no new nation built. Well, you'd think these are some of the lessons we might learn from history. Then you get to Iraq. Um, then you get now to Syria. And they're all slowly getting sucked in. And now why don't we learn something about it? Why don't we let them fight it out themselves and decide, you know, if they, which side wins? Um, well, one side wins. It'll be shorter. Um, David Owen, who is the um, uh, European Union negotiator um, uh, on Bosnia, um, he told me once, he said, you know, I think the way we've been conducting our attempts to limit this conflict has actually led to the deaths of 200,000 extra people. Um, now, uh, uh, Burke, uh, a great philosopher of prudence, um, he wrote, um, a reformer, a reformer must not only have a confident expectation that the future will be better than the past. Well, all reformers have an expectation that that will be true. But this is the point, that it will be sufficiently better to make up for the evils of the transition. I mean, that is a piece of great historical wisdom. And it's one that's almost consistently ignored by our statesmen. Now, nevertheless, I end with this thought. We are making some progress. We believe there's some progress being made in human affairs, though I don't think it has much to do with history. Um, you don't need history to build a bridge. Um, you may feel you need history to build a nation. But the reason, as Professor Joffe said, is that atoms don't have minds of their own. Uh, so you can't have laws of history in the same way you can have confident laws of physics. Now, <laughs> Science, in other words, is, does represent a principle of progress in human affairs. And that's why I'm not um, quite sure about um, uh, Diana Pinto's um, um, uh, remark that we must limit, did you say the rule of economics or the hegemony of economics? I think you, you actually hegemony. used hegemony of economics. Um, you know, um, in the 18th century, people used to talk about the douceur of economics. Um, you can, and the truth is, you can make far more progress in economics than you can in politics. Um, I believe that the real criticism of Israel in today's situation is that it's strangling the economic development of the Palestinians. Um, this has produced 27% unemployment on most of the West Bank and aborted the growth of a Palestinian middle class. And so economics... Um, is uh, needed to bring some sadly, some, you know, very, very much lacking douceur to this area. That's an example of how science and technology can have beneficent effects on politics. It makes political reactions less violent. It enlarges the scope of peaceful solutions. It even makes military conflict less brutal than it used to be. And even contemporary dictatorships are less horrendous. And in war, we become horrified when we have a few people killed, whereas in the recent past, we were indifferent to the deaths of thousands. Now, I think that is progress, but it doesn't seem to me it has anything to do with history. And I mean, if we allow this, these sort of strands of progress um, to continue, then I think there's some hope. But the real question is, is humankind too addicted to its crimes, follies, and misfortunes to allow that to happen? Thank you, Professor Skidleski. So you say peace 
gives one good history and not the other way around. And my sense is, or, or my question is, how to break this vicious circle that I feel that we live in, whereby our history and our bad memories are the one that may be preventing us from moving towards peace and moving towards uh, a better and a joint future. Uh, you suggested econ economy, maybe technological uh, progress as well, and I would ask the panel if we were trying to take uh, one historical-based recommendation for the uh, decision-maker of uh, this country and of this region to create a better future, where would we start it? In which part of the world? In this part of the world, the Middle East. Well, you've got a mechanism. You've got the customs union mechanism, which was uh, agreed by the Oslo Accords. Um, and try and make it work. Do something to make it work. I mean, of course, there are huge problems in the way. But if you can make it work, if you can free up um, trade, I mean, um, Palestinians tell me they can't export very well because uh, you know, everything has to go through security, they can't import. You know, there are lots of things you could do. Um, it doesn't, I don't think history is going to help. The growth of trust is certainly going to be important. Time will be important. Um, but and you've got to start somewhere, and that's the place I would start. And I think I would eventually involve Lebanon, Jordan, in a kind of European uh, type free trade area. All right, um, you'll say it's impossible, but then everything else is impossible. So um, among these impossibilities, this seems to me the one that um, carries uh, more hope than some of the others. Thank you.